If we have not met, my name is Charlie Salomon, lead pastor of Westview Bible Church here, and this is my first Easter with all of you. So this is a special time for me as well. Uh, by the way, if you are new, if you're a guest uh, visiting us for the first time, it would be great if you could text the word new to the following number, 438 808-1028. Again, it's 438-808-1028. Just a way that we can connect with you. So, um, <clears throat> okay. So it's Easter. And I suppose that you guys are probably accustomed to, on Easter, having, uh, you know, the pastor talk about the passages surrounding the empty tomb. Of course, you know, verses like that, or maybe when Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, sat down and he ate some fish with the disciples after, you know, he rose from the dead. That, that might be a passage that maybe we'll look at maybe some other time. Today we're going to do something a little different. Um, we are actually going to walk through a passage of scripture in the Old Testament. We are going to uh, discuss the book of Jonah. We're going to walk through Jonah today. Wait, what? Jonah? The, the guy with the, the fish? Yeah, Jonah. Um, the reason why it is an Easter passage, and you're going to understand that. The book of Jonah is about Easter. Uh, actually, uh, beginning, if you guys uh, would consider for a second, uh, we're going to start in the New Testament. The book of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 38, goes like this. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, Jesus, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, uh, they wanted Jesus to perform a miracle, to do a sign for them. And Jesus, as you probably know, at other times, he was accustomed to doing just that. He did many miracles, and he did many signs and wonders. But on this particular occasion, he said that it was wicked for them to demand this kind of proof. And he said he wasn't going to give them any sign except for the sign of Jonah. And my friends, my great hope for us today is that we also would not only understand why Jesus is saying this, but we ourselves would see the sign of Jonah today. That's my hope. It's a, it's a lofty, it's a high hope, but I'm going to pray that the Lord would grant this request. Father God, I pray that you would enable it, that we would be able to see the sign of Jonah this morning as you open your scriptures to us by the power of the Holy Spirit that you have gifted to believers. Lord, let it be the case. Let us not be like the, the Pharisees who persisted in unbelief, but let us have our eyes open by faith. Do that this morning, this afternoon, I should say. In your name, amen. All right, so if you have your Bible or if you have your phone, if you want to follow along with me, otherwise I'll be reading the scriptures, but it's the book of Jonah, and I'll be looking at the English Standard Version. So if you want to follow along with me, you can just Google Jonah 1 ESV, and, and we'll begin from there. So verse 1 goes like this. Now this is about 800 years before Jesus, FYI. The prophet Jonah wrote this about 800 BC, give or take. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amity, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. This is a familiar beginning to a story because it is the beginning of the great story. This is the story of the entire Bible. God has looked down upon the children of man and he has perceived evil in their hearts. And who is God? 
What is his character? Is his character to condemn or is his character to save? He sent Jonah to be a messenger because his first desire was to save. Perhaps you've heard the scripture. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world would be saved through him. In the same way, he is sending Jonah. And I'm going to tell you in advance, Jonah is a foreshadow of Jesus in an interesting way. He is a foreshadow of Jesus in the ways that he is like Jesus. And in a strange way, he's a foreshadow of Jesus in the ways that he is starkly opposite of Jesus. And you're going to see how both of these have a way of pointing us to Jesus. Okay? Let's keep reading. We get to verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Okay. God tells Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah hops in a boat and goes the opposite direction. <laughs> So we can see right away he's a bit different from Jesus, isn't he? Okay? Jesus was in the habit of submitting to his father even unto death. Jonah is not willing to go to Nineveh. He goes the opposite direction. And the text has a little bit of subtle humor. It says that Jonah went to Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord. As if. <laughs> As if you can flee from the presence of the Lord. But Jonah thinks he can. And you know what? It's a common mistake. This also is the story of mankind. We've been doing this since the very beginning. For those who are with us on Good Friday, Cheryl talked about how Adam and Eve did that in the garden. Sin entered the world. What did Adam and Eve do? They hid. And we've been doing it ever since. Do you know where unbelief comes from? Do you know where unbelief comes from? It's nothing more than sinful man hiding from a very real and present God. Do you know where dead and empty religion comes from? It's the same thing. Sinful man hiding from God, trying to cover up their sin with, with, with religious rituals that will never change the heart. So it's a common story. Jonah is fleeing from God. But we know that doesn't work. And it's not going to work in this story. You get to verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them, but Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. I told you that Jonah is a foreshadow, and maybe you're starting to see it now. Do you see what's happening here? You have a handful of men on a boat in the middle of the sea. A storm hits. The men are all freaking out. They're all panicking while the main character of the story is fast asleep. Does that sound familiar? For those of you who know their Bible even a little bit, or if you spend some time in church, you know this story. This is about Jesus. They were all freaking out. They woke Jesus up, and he calmed the storm. You see it in Mark 4, Matthew 8, Luke 8. Here, God is doing something. He's telling us all this story isn't really about Jonah. The, the story is about who the whole Bible is about. It's about Jesus. Why was Jesus sleeping in the midst of a storm? Because he had perfect peace. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Jesus was leaning on the everlasting arms. He had no reason to fear, even, even in a storm. He had, he had no reason to fear. And when the disciples woke him up, he rebuked them. And he said, why are you guys afraid? Don't you know I'm with you? Okay, why is Jonah sleeping in the midst of a storm. Because he's a prideful and arrogant fool. He is right in the middle of rebelling against God. Yet he finds it able in himself to sleep like a baby. Whoa. Here is a man who is totally void of the fear of the Lord. 
Uh, I, have ad- I have advice for all of us this morning. If you're in the habit of disregarding the word of God, don't sleep like a baby because you don't have reason to sleep like a baby. Uh, Jesus actually, he told us that story, didn't he? Of this man who thought that he was able to put his feet up and rest. And what did, what did God say to him? You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. What else do the scriptures say? While people are saying peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them and they will not escape. Beloved, that's a warning spoken in love. Don't sleep like a baby while you're hiding from God. So Jonah's, Jonah's sleeping, but you know, not for long. The folks wake him up. Let's keep reading. They said to one another, the, the sailors, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Once more, subtle humor. Jonah says he fears the Lord. (laughs) Ha! Ha! As if. Okay? Jonah is a fellow who doesn't fear the Lord. Not yet. Um, These sailors, um, they've been caught in a storm before. I mean, this is before, like, modern weather, you know. This is before you can just Google it and find out if a storm is coming. However, on this particular day, when the storm came, they perceived that it was more than a regular storm. They perceived that they were in the presence of divine displeasure. And they figured out someone on this boat did something very wrong. And they were correct. So they wake up Jonah, and Jonah says, yeah, it's me. Let's keep reading. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, The men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. (laughs) Excuse me. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. I don't know if you're putting the pieces together, but I'm going to help you do it. The sea is raging. It's raging with the displeasure, with the anger of God. And Jonah says, sacrifice me into the storm of God's anger and you will live. I die, you live. Are you putting the pieces together? Why was Jesus sent to the cross? Why did he have to die? The New Testament uses this word. He died as a propitiation. And I know that's not a common word. It's not a word we use in our normal language. So I'll go ahead and define it for you. A propitiation is a payment that turns away wrath. Offer up my life, and the storm will calm. Offer up my life, and the wrath of God will turn from you. God the Father is a loving and merciful and compassionate and slow to anger, patient God. And his first desire in sending his son is to be our savior. He sent his son to save us. He is loving. That's who he is. That's his character. But don't be confused because his character is also to judge evil. His character is not to push sin under the rug. The evil that we've all committed 
in our sins and iniquities and, and hiding from him the secret things that have happened in the secret places of our hearts, someone's going to pay for that, you know. Someone has to pay for that. And the message is the same. Like Jonah said, Jesus is telling us, sacrifice me, offer up my life, and you will live. And by faith, that's what we do. In believing in Jesus, we are offering him up to be our payment. And just as the storm calmed for the people in Jonah's story, and just like the storm calmed for the disciples, the peace that transcends understanding can be ours. Well, let's keep reading. Because this should be the end of the story. I mean, you throw a man into the sea in the middle of a storm, that should be the end of him. And when they put Jesus in the tomb after dying on the cross, that should have been the end of the story. It wasn't. And in this story, it's not the end either. Verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. In three days, there's going to be a resurrection of Jonah. It's a foreshadow of the great story. And I suppose at this point of the story, I could take a little moment to just interject something because this particular story I've noticed has been the target of a fair amount of scoffing. I get it. I was once myself a raging atheist, you know, who would ridicule Christians for their silly beliefs. Yeah, right. You want me to believe that a man got swallowed by a great fish for three days and then he lived? You want me to believe that? Yes, I want you to believe that. Look around. Look around. Where did this come from? Take a breath. Where did life come from? God has shown himself to all of us. The God who made the sky and the sea and the dry land and has granted life to us. Do you think it was difficult for him to have a fish swallow someone for three days? I suspect it was rather easy. If the God that you conceive of is not able to do that, he's hardly God. Okay? This is just me encouraging you to kind of come out of hiding. If you have a hard time believing a story like this, come out of hiding and consider God who he is. This is easy for him. So Jonah's is in the fish, and we get to chapter 2, and it goes like this. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountain. I went down to the land upon whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me up, my life from the pit. O oh Lord, my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. So chapter 2 has been analyzed by scholars, and some of them have been baffled by it, thinking that it doesn't belong here. Now, on one hand, um, some of the things that Jonah is saying, it's as if he's not in a fish. He's speaking as if he is in a tomb, in the grave. He says, I am in Sheol, the place of death. He says, uh, I'm in the pit. I was rescued from the pit. 
which is also a Hebrew word for the grave. And he talks about being surrounded by the land. He's at the roots of the mountain, the land that covered him. He's talking as if he is in the grave. Which makes sense because it's ultimately a story about the resurrection of the Lord, Christ. But, but that, that's not why scholars have been a little baffled by it. They say that it doesn't belong in chapter 2. It belongs later in the story. It doesn't belong. He shouldn't be saying this while he is yet in the fish. And the reason they say that is because he's not simply praying. He is singing. You, you, when you look at the language, you can see this is the language of the Psalms. The genre here is a song. He is singing. He is singing a song of praise and thanksgiving. And some have said, well, why would he be singing praise and thanksgiving while the man is yet in the fish? And the reason is his eyes have been opened by the power of the resurrection he can see. By faith he can see while still in the fish. While still in the place of hardship and darkness and trouble and pain he can see so he sings. It's been a hard year. Amen. It's been a hard year. Death, COVID, thorns and thistles, as the scriptures say, hardship surrounding us. Yet, I am here now urging us to consider the resurrection. Because the resurrection that happened points to something. Do you know what the power of the re resurrection is for the Christian? Do you know what it is? And someone will say, I know. I know what it is. If we believe in Jesus... After we die, there will come a day when our bodies will be resurrected and we will be with the Lord forever. You are correct. But it's more than that. Hear this part. For the believer, the resurrection happens in two phases. Do you know that? For the believer, the resurrection happens in two phases. When we turn to the Lord... When we come out of our place of hiding and we say, Jesus, I need you. I, I need a savior. I'm a sinner. By faith, I believe in you. When we turn to him in faith, do you know what happens then? Our spirits are resurrected. By the power of the Holy Spirit, our spirits are resurrected. And with the eyes of faith, we see. We go from darkness to light. And even as we're surrounded by hardship and trouble and COVID, by faith we see, and from the belly of the fish we sing. We sing songs of praise and thanksgiving. Because Jesus, the resurrected Lord, is alive inside of us. That is the Christian life. Though outwardly our bodies are wasting away, inwardly, we are being transformed from glory to glory. It's a supernatural life. Jonah. Jesus is living in him and Jonah is singing. And so the fish spits him out. And you get to chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. Jonah's got a totally different perspective on the whole thing. <laughs> Jonah goes to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Okay. 
Now, uh, if you uh, go on uh, Wikipedia and, uh, you know, check out Nineveh, you're going to find that at the time of Jonah, Nineveh was the largest city on earth. So Jonah is not kidding when, you know, the scriptures say it takes three days to walk through the city. And so Jonah takes a whole day walking, walking into the city, he goes right into the center, and he starts to preach. Repent, turn, because in 40 days, God's going to judge this city. And the strangest of things happen. Let's keep reading. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The, world reached the, the word reached to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Okay. They repented. The largest city on earth repented. From the least of them to the greatest of these. Jonah, the unwilling prophet, just became the most successful missionary in all of history. And so this is the question I would like to propose to us. Why? Why did the people of Nineveh listen to this foreigner preaching about his foreign God? Why did the proud city of Nineveh pay any attention to this guy from Israel. There's no record of Jonah performing signs or wonders or miracles. Well, I suppose it happened like this. Jonah goes in, he starts preaching. Word gets to the king. Hey, there's a guy proclaiming judgment. Okay, so what? This is a pretty big city. We got lots of people with lots of strange ideas. Yeah, well, the thing is, O King, I listened to him, and I have to say, it really doesn't sound like he's making it up. I've listened to him, and I have to say that he speaks with a level of conviction that really makes me think that this guy was actually sent by God. Consider it, if you will. You spend three days in a fish and then the fish spits you out. I think you're going to be speaking with a level of conviction that might just pierce even the hardest of hearts. What is the sign of Jonah? Bringing it back to the beginning. What is the sign of Jonah? The people wanted a miracle. And Jesus said the only sign they're going to get is the sign of Jonah. What is the sign of Jonah? It's when men and women like you and I testify of the power of the resurrection which we have experienced. That is the sign of Jonah. When Jonah spoke, the people said, this man was indeed sent by God to preach to us. And beloved, I suspect that you have people in your life, people you know, people you've experienced, and, and hopefully you yourself. But if not you yourself, you know people who have experienced the power of the resurrection in their spirit. And maybe, just maybe, God is giving you the perception that as I am up here talking to you, I am not doing this just because it's my job. I'm not doing this just because they pay me to do it. I, too, have experienced the power of the resurrection, and God expects you to recognize when someone is speaking to you as sent by him. That's Old Testament truth, and that's New Testament truth. 
God expects us to recognize when people are speaking on his behalf. And the message from Jonah and the message from Jesus is the same message. Come out of hiding in the secret places of your heart. Turn to him. In the secret places of your heart, say, I believe that I'm a sinner. I'm not going to hide from you anymore. I believe that I am a sinner, but I have heard that you are a savior. And I need you. And let me tell you what God is going to do now. Now. You also will receive the gift from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit. And now, by faith, your spirit will be resurrected in the knowledge of God. That's the promise. And that's what we are proclaiming to you. That is what we are celebrating on this Easter. He is risen indeed. Father God, let this message echo out. Like you did in Nineveh, do it in Montreal. Let it echo out. Let it multiply in our hearts. Send us out to the people of this city. Your word has spoken that we will receive power when you come upon us, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and we will be your witnesses. Lord, let it be so. Let the sign of Jonah be seen in Montreal through us as we have experienced the power of your resurrection. Lord, you have risen from the dead, and so it is with our spirits. Let it be so. Let it be evident to this world. We ask you for this kind of revival, and we praise you, for you are risen from the dead. Amen.